Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And I assure you that you are in for a treat because this session could save you a lot of money in unnecessary losses. Now, what do I mean by that? Because day trading is often unprofitable for a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. And those who are able to do it successfully and profitably are actually in a class of their own. And today we have got two expert traders with us who will be sharing with you their personal experiences and a few tips and tricks that will most likely save you money, but more importantly, save you a lot of heartache and stress. Our first guest has more than 15 years of experience trading. She also provides trading education to both institutional and retail clients. She trades a whole range of instruments, forex, equities, commodities. She's got a strong focus on quantitative trading methods. She's the founder and chief trainer of TerraSeeds, Ms. Binny Ong. Hello, hi. Thanks for joining us, Binny. Our second guest has been the top trading representative and top CFD achiever every year from 2014 to 2019 at Philip Securities. And his story about how he recovered from a $740,000 debt has been an inspiration to many people. He's the chief trainer of Trading Impossible, Mr. Joey Choi. Thank you so much, Edward. Thanks for joining us, Joey. So we're going to start with Binny. Binny, I think for a lot of people, when they think of professional stock traders, they see someone hunched over a keyboard, grabbing their mouse, staring at six monitors at the same time. It's all full of graphs and spreadsheets. What does trading actually look like in your case? Hi, Edward. Uh, hi, everybody out there viewing the session. Unfortunately, I don't have six monitors. I have only two monitors and four servers. Okay, my servers are in the cloud. So I work a little bit different from the rest where you can see like uh, four screens or six screens. I don't have that. In fact, I hate to view screens. Okay, I, I guess that in order to let you guys understand about uh, my own trading and probably what is the evolution of trading, let's talk about uh, a little bit to de deviate from the, set, the topic, right? To talk about my portfolio. I have a main two types of portfolio. One is what we call the recurring passive uh, income. That means that even if I don't trade, uh, you know, this portfolio will give me the money, all right? And they consist mainly of Singapore REITs, and that's a very important part of my portfolio. All right, as you know, REITs, um, if you, you can buy REITs and you get into one that's good dividends, it pays you every quarter, every half a year. And another huge part will be the bonds and the unit trust. So this would be the income portfolio that I have. All right, the other aspect of my trading will be uh, the other spectrum, which will be really the very aggressive type, aggressive trading. So my day starts at actually 6.10, 6.10 in the morning, <laughs> because I make sure that I have to bring my children to work, uh, to, to school, not work. They, they are very young. One is doing PSLE uh, this year. Another one is uh, in P2. I want to have a bit of time with them. So I bring them to school and then I, I, I also want to get my 15 minutes of exercise. And that's really very important. That clear my mind. And it, at 8.30, I'm, I'm at my desk to watch the uh, US market close and to get updated with the news, to watch the Singapore market, especially the futures market, how the futures market behave, how the, uh, the other Asian markets are moving, the Nikkei, the Australia, how, how they are moving. And that's where I get started with the Singapore market. Uh, and as well as the Hang Seng market. Uh, that's the other aspect. And I do also, also a lot of momentum trading. So that means that what, which are the mover shakers and which are the stocks that move. And of course, they are maintained both sides, either the long side or the short side. So whether the market is moving up or down, that's beneficial to me. One of the key aspects that I'm trading is also the uh, futures, okay, especially into the Simski market. All right? So that's the Simski will be the Singapore uh, index futures. Right, that is also a key instrument. At the, at the other spectrum will be the Forex, the commodity, and the index. I know you guys probably think that I'm crazy. I'm trading so many things. But again, back into the, uh, you know, the, the lifestyle, how to manage this, because about 80% of my activities are actually outsourced. Outsourced to the, uh, to the AI that's running. Right? So I outsource that to the uh, technologies behind who are managing my trades and that's especially in the forex in the commodities and in the index trading so my time actually uh, it's quite short in a way because i start at 6 10 i make sure i sleep at 10 30 that's why i don't really do much of the u.s market because uh, sad to say i need to sleep <laughs> and that's uh 
something that's new. And, and I want to highlight a little bit about the tra uh, trading evolution. Now it seems that uh, you know, a lot of my activities are technology-based, but I actually started from the very uh, old-fashioned type of uh, trading with Teletext and CRT. I'm not sure how many of you guys know about Teletext, and here I'd like to show you guys a picture on Teletext, and that re really reminds me on the uh, you know, the past, okay, because I started at the age that, at the age that I'm not supposed to start, actually. So this is the CRT TV that's on my, on my table, uh, you know, and I love green colors because green colors means up. I, I love like page 306 to 308 because that's the top volume and that's the, uh, you know, top gainers. Uh, I hate white colors because that means down, okay, so that's really uh, my trading evolution from the CRT teletext that I can't look around to the very high to the bit of a technology side where I can use the mobile and uh, run a lot run a lot of servers for my own trading. Yeah, I love that. Thank you for sharing that with us, Vinny. Yeah. <laughs> I was telling you earlier the only time when I was a kid that I saw teletext was because my grandparents used it to check the four D results. So yeah. I wish I had that education. And that level of interest. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and also just to clarify, uh, one of our viewers asked, I'm not related to Joey. We have the same surname though. <laughs> we look a bit like brothers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thanks for that, Vinny. We're going to go on to Joey because he's quite different from Vinny in that he's much more focused on equities because Joey, you just trade stocks, but you also have a full-time job trading stocks. As it reminds you, how does that work? What, what, what's the job like? Okay, good. So yeah, I'm actually a Remizio in Philips Securities. Uh, there are many terms for it. You know, some people call it like a dealer, some call it a trading representative, but basically we're just like a stock broker. So anybody who want to buy stocks, whether it's like Singapore stocks, US stocks, any stocks in any markets, they pretty much come to me. Right? And why do they come to me? All right? So I've been always trying to, to add value to clients. All right? and, and I would say my day um, start off um, pretty much same as uh, being, I tend to wake up early, like about 4.30 a.m. because my kids... Two young kids, even younger than Beanie, all right, K2 and uh, Premi 1. So I have to sleep like you know, 9 p.m. and then, you know, wake up early. And uh, so I try to wake up 4 30, go for a run, come back, and then read up on the market news. So pretty much start off the day early. Um, and, and that's where I probably by about 6 30 a.m. to 7 a.m., that's where I settle down, look at the you know, news flow and some of the ideas that have came out based on last night's you know, movement or maybe the previous day's movement. So I pretty much focus on like the Singapore market over the past, I would say, 10 years, right? But over the past six months, I've been, you know, slowly moving into the US market. So even though, see my Bini, you know, I, you know, I just want to, I need to sleep early, right? So it's really quite hard, but I think there are a lot of opportunity, opportunities coming in the US market. So that's why I'm a bit focusing, focusing on them as well, a bit more mid to longer term positions, which I don't really need to monitor so much. All right. And, and yeah, so I would say my job as a, a broker, all right, is pretty much about um, serving clients, giving clients like ideas, uh, and, and sharing my, my opinions on certain stocks, but I feel that there could be a bit more upside and perhaps you know, clients might want to look at them as well. And then I have like a Telegram group that I share to the public as well on my email. And uh, we do have like a system, all right? Um, same thing, I mean, like um, we need like kind of like outsource some of those stuff to kind of like take all the um, hard work out of the equation, right? So same thing. So I have like a system to kind of like make things a bit simple for me. I mean, there are like more than 800 stocks in the, market, in the Singapore market. In the US, there's more than three, 4,000. So how do we actually look at so many stocks, right? So we have a system that kind of like keep things a bit simple or I kind of filters out just a few stocks for us to focus on. And that's where we want to drill down on them. And if it's good, we put it in my watch list, I monitor them, my KIV, and then I decide to take one or two, right? And probably share uh, one or two clients as well as some of my students, my inner circle members as well. All right, so yeah, as a job, um, um, reminder, this is something I've been doing for the past, I would say, 10 years, all right, and I've been, um, yeah, pretty much um, doing it, and then I enjoy, I enjoy my job, I would say, when I, mean, I first started, <clears throat> I had so much to learn, and along the way, I, I you know, gained the skills and knowledge, and then, uh, yeah, one of the very, very rewarding job, and also I feel I could do a job that I like as well, and at the same time, treat at the same time, so that, that is one, probably one of the best things that have happened to me. Oh, thanks for sharing that, Joey. Yeah. I'm going to go back to Binny right now. So, Binny, actually, having spoken to you about your daily schedule, it actually looks very much the same like every other working parent out there. You know, you've got kids and they work an office job. Uh, 
So it, it might sound interesting to people like, oh, professional traders also like that. But you also mentioned that it's really important to take care of your physical health. And how do you manage that? Um, okay. Well, because you know that when you are trading, most of the time we are sitting on our desks, right? Many times that you do as you age, I, I, because I can feel it right along the way when I started off with myself at 17 and 18 years old, versus now at my age at 40, 43, 44 years old, it's, it's a huge difference. So you have to, in a way, to outsource for, for me, like what Joey did, because he runs, how to say, I, I, I presume that he has screening, has scanning, he filter his uh, list of stocks, 800 stocks into a watch list. And that's pretty much what we do. But on top of that, what we have is that we just have to decide for example, uh, these are the stocks or these are the trades that we want to put it in. And we let the machines manage the trade, to put in the trade, to, um, to shift the stop loss, to do the trailing stops. That might be a little bit technical, but even to uh, manage our emotions to us. So we don't really stare very much at the screen. Uh, a huge part of our trading activities are, are in fact semi-automated meaning that we just have to make sure that we agree with what the machines are telling us. We give the final approval to the machine. It's a little bit, we, we can choose to override the machines, what they are saying. So in a huge part, they outsource a huge part of, the, of our trading to the machines, right? But we are not giving up the full control, right? And yet they free, our, free us from our mind. And because of this, then I have a lot of time with uh, my children, even to pack them lunch uh, to do my exercise and that's really very important and especially for those people who might consider to, to trade or to invest after you have retired uh, it's quite tedious to be sitting full-time in front of your screen you get a lot of back pain you can suffer a lot of things and you probably go to the sensei and do some acupuncture a lot more time uh, you know and, and you have it, it's, it's a whole lot of things so I guess that it's the shift in the technology that's number one last again you have to have a method which are i think systematic you have to know what kind of methods you want to use systematic plus i guess that the method i'm using is also very much mathematical that allows the method to be programmed into the machines okay so i guess that to answer your questions um to be able to maintain that healthy lifestyle uh, and at the same time to trade into really so many instruments you have to look at trading from the different aspect. It's not really about six monitors and you keep staring there. You have to maintain the lifestyle for longevity. I, I guess that longevity is the key word here. We're, we're about the same age, so I, I'm really feeling it when, when you're saying that. Like, yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, also, if you're viewing this right now and you're, you've got questions, uh, there's already quite a few questions already entered. We'll try to get to as many of your questions as you can. Please enter them in the comments box and we'll try to answer them later on in the session uh, and we'll try to get through as many as we can. We're going to go over to Joey right now. Uh, Joey, it's more than just the physical health though, right? The mental health aspect is also really important for traders. That's something you can't neglect. And I, I want to talk to you, Joey, because you went through a period of really great stress uh, because your client incurred a massive loss could you talk through what happened in that period and how you got through it? Sure, sure. So yes, what happens was, uh, I mean, long story short, what happens was like about 2013, 2014, you know, a client of mine had kind of like over leverage, right? And, and the losses came up to like, Seven hundred and forty thousand dollars, seven four zero. All right, so it's quite a huge loss. And basically, what happens is most people don't really know this, but as a reminder or like as a stock broker in in Singapore, we are pretty much liable for clients' losses if they were to default. Right, most of the time, to be honest, it doesn't happen. Ninety nine percent of the time, most people are pretty good. All right, things get you know and, and paid up and everything's good. But that one percent sometimes it does happen. So it kind of like hit me. All right, then and. Yeah, the client just, you know, because I think he can't over leverage, he can't trade it in other brokerages as well, all right, and we didn't know about that, all right, because I only could see my side of the, the business, all right, my side of the, the brokerage where he's trading it in Philip, all right, and yeah, the losses came out to $740,000, and that was like, like three months before my first child was born, all right, and 
it was quite terrible. It was really quite depressing. You know, I almost like, I, I mean, I worked really hard and served my clients well. When it happened, I just didn't have any mood to do anything. All right. And I was pretty much lost. Right. And, you know, my, my son was about to be born in like a few months. We had like, you know, I only had like $200 in, in my bank account. I think I didn't even have enough funds to like buy a pram. Right. Thankfully, my wife, uh, you know, came, you know, stepped up and, and uh, she continued her job. All right. And that's where she started, you know, supporting the whole family. And from then on, you know, after my child was born, I managed to, you know, I decided that I have to, I have to wake up, right? Because I was like a zombie. I didn't want to go to work, you know, like three, four months. I was just waking up late and not doing anything. Very, very depressing. I, I, I found out that was, you know, I, I have to pay like interest on the client's debt. It's like $3,000 a month. So I was like working so hard now I have to pay interest on somebody's debt. I was like, what, what's happening? I have no idea what's happening at all, you know, but, and it's like, it's not 70, you know, 70, I think, okay, no problem. 700 is a huge amount. So after a few months when I, my ch child was born and that's where I decided to, you know, wake up and need to do something either declare bankrupt like the client or I fight right so prayed about it with my family and eventually I decided to fight and you know I decided to really change the way I, I do things right I mean, in terms of the market stock market you know I, I totally revamped the way that I do run my broking business as well how you know I you know I, I mean, before the incident I was pretty much just cruising you know just just cruising along, doing what I need to do. But I, did, I decided that, you know, I need to step up and really make effort to reach out to clients, all right, and to add value to clients, to build the broking business from scratch, you know, so based on build out my system in terms of trading, that's where I, you know, develop a system after that. And in terms of my own trading income as well, you know, slowly build up the performance, you know, and, and you know, see the consistency come in. So slowly building up and that's how, you know, after two and a half years, I managed to like completely pay off the debt. So I come like borrowed like half a meal from my mom, all right. Um, and it's not like, I mean, we're all like middle income family. We, my mom didn't like have half a meal, all right. You have to like mortgage the house and let me like half a meal, all right. And if not, I have to pay like interest, right. So we figured out that that was the better choice and we went for that. And it was really tough, all right. And I had late like, nights almost every single night, you know, talking to myself on videos. Uh, people like to see all the good stuff, you know, but people don't really see what happens at at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m., all right? And that, that's what's happened, right? So we do all kinds of things to add value, to get markets, learn, hold my skills better. And very thankfully, thank God, I managed to come back up in about like two and a half years, somewhere in 2016. And that's where I started having like a course. A lot of people started asking me, you know, and that's where I have a course to kind of teach people as well, you know, about markets. And then that's where we have like this uh, live event. Where of course, now we can't do it. We, we, we call that a uh, precision trading intensive. And right now we're looking at a few like other online courses as well, right? So that's pretty much my journey. It was pretty tough, but thankfully managed to come back out from it all through the stock market. And, and that's why I would say uh, really fortunate. And yeah, that, that's that's my pretty much my story. Thank you for sharing that. We really appreciate it. And if you're watching this right now, and you know, I'd like to remind you that whatever you're facing financially, uh, it's not the end. Yeah, it's not the end. It will feel terrible. It will feel like you're in a dead end, but it's not the end. Lots of people, Joey, uh, myself, I, I, I had double digits left in my bank account at one point because I, I did a lot of stupid things, uh, have come back from absolutely nothing to very healthy bank balances. It's just a matter of hanging in there and continuing to do the right thing rather than, especially when we have a lot of losses, you, you tend to start doing stupid things. And that's why I want to go back to Benny now and ask her about this because, you know, when your trades are not performing well, when things are not going well, when you're starting to lose money, how do you keep yourself balanced? Okay, um, this is a very important question, I think, because um, let me just, just start with the, my lifestyle. I think I also saw that from some of the questions, right? Now, one of the key thing and one of the things that I must do, whether it's raining or whether it is not, just that as long as there's no thunder, then I will do my morning exercise from 7.15 until 8 uh, a.m. Okay, that, that will be what I will do every morning, right? And I happen to live in near a place and the park that I go to happen to have wild balls, free roaming chickens, naughty monkeys, squirrels, crickets, but and, and I see them every day. All right, no joke about that. I, I'm not... Um, I'm not telling you a story that's in the friendly land, but that, that's really where I'm staying, the park I visit every day. And that sort of like really bring me back to where I was living last time because I, I stay in Lim Chu Kang, that's the kampong, all right? And uh, it's clear my mind and it's really clear my mind for the rest of the day because then that's where I can really de-stress 
I, I can think of nothing else but just to be with the chickens and with the naughty monkeys. Again, they are really naughty. Okay. So, so that's part of the morning exercise and I really do a lot of cardio, sweat it out and that's it. All right, but more important, going back into trading, it's a very important thing to maintain a very healthy portfolio. All right, and I start off with saying that I have this recurring passive income. That means that if the market is not doing well, where your trading income doesn't come in, all right, you still make sure that you have an income that provides for your family. And that's really very important. All right, um, I'm glad to say that I built this income, that recurring income with my first pot of gold that I made very, very long time ago. And, and I, every time when, when I make money, I plow that into the recurring income. Okay, so that's really set me up for quite a while. I just want to highlight, for example, when I first started, and I started somewhere in 1996. That's like a long time ago, right? And that's the time where I have to really swear that every stock that you pick, as long as you can hold on for a while and you have a bit of a beginner's luck, hold on for a while and you make the money eventually. That's what's easy period. But remember what happened in 1997? That's the Asia financial crisis, all right? And we went through the normal crisis. We have the SARS, we have the dot-com crash, and there wasn't any central bank to come in to print the money to do the QE to save us. Okay, we don't have that. We went through a normal cycle, all right? So that's where I think that if you want to cope with your losses, you have to be flexible. Flexible means that instead of going long to buy only equities or stocks, be flexible with the instruments that you are choosing right now because there are really tons of instruments right now that allows you to tap in the other direction, which is to sell in a bear market. That is to go short, all right? So you can explore using, for example, the Simsky, all right, the one that is uh, listed in the SGX, all right, the Simsky, or you might want to explore into the DLCs, all right? So these are something that you want to look into. Lastly, uh, to really cope with losses, you have to be focused and uh, nimble. Okay, what is the meaning of nimble here? When you have a cut loss point, please stick to it, right? And what my um, mother will always say that, you know, please don't put your stocks in the fridge and leave it to your grandchildren. All right. That is something that I remember by heart. All right. So when you need to cut loss, then cut your losses and be focused because there are different trends in the market. There are trends which are long-term trends that you can hold for value investing, but there are also um, portfolio that you have that is for trading. So if it's trading, please don't turn it into a long-term stock holding when things are not going your way, all right? Uh, so for example, for my own automations, there are defined levels which are automatically being crafted by the machines, all right, in the algos that we put in. So once we hit this level, for example, we will just cut our losses. But if it doesn't, we don't panic. We just make sure that we use a, uh, you know, we just be calm about it and we just look at it as, as per normal. All right, and we don't really, uh, you know, stare at it and stress over it. All right, so that's where you have to be very, very disciplined. So, so end, of the day, yep. yeah, end of the day is to one thing to share with you guys. All right, and this is from my experience. Write the winners, cut losses, cut the loser. <laughs> that one must print out, frame and put on your wall in front of you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that is really a heartfelt because we went through the losing period. We went through all the crisis. It's, it's imprinted. Uh, we, we don't need to print. It's cuffed in my heart. I think Joey as well, right? Edward as well. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. yeah chasing losers has been wow, num my number one bugbear. It's the worst thing. Yeah, anyway. share a bit of my experience here. Uh, go mean, ahead, Joey. Yeah. I mean, based on what Bini have said, I mean, being a, a broker as well, all right, just to share my experience working with like thousands of clients, all right. And I, and I believe that is entirely true. I think more than 70, maybe more than 80% of the people, all right. And you know, some of my clients, they pass me their portfolio and they're like more than 30, 20, 20. I ask them, you know, what, what are these stocks? You know, and most of the time people have no idea why they're buying these stocks. And, you know, when I look at these stocks that they're holding, most of the time it's losers. Most people will not hold a winning stocks, right? They'll probably, you know, when they make like 5%, a few hundred dollars, a few thousand, they cut it. But they're losers. If you lose $200, you will never sell, all right? And that's it. And people are holding on to your losses and the losses of 200 become 1,000, 2,000, 5,000. And, and many times they're they too afraid to look at their whole portfolio. So I believe that that's true. Most people like to, um, you know, take profit 
trust, all right, and it let their lo losers really right. And that's the reason one of the main psychological, I would say, emotions that people face. And that's the reason why most people do not do well in, in the market, right? Yeah. It's like what Finney's mom said, right? Don't put it in the fridge. <laughs> Leave yeah, it to your exactly. Kids. It's, yeah. it's like food, it'll go bad. Oh, I mean, a, a quick thing that I said, my ex-classmate from university actually asked me to look at her portfolio last year. I'm not an expert, but then I, I saw the first three names she had. SIA, oh, SPH, oh, SEMCOP, oh. oh. And this is early last year, so it, it was not pleasant. She said, I've been holding this for eight years already. How come it's like that? Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Let's think about rebalancing. <laughs> okay, uh, so we're going to move on to some of the questions that our viewers have right now. And... There's quite a few questions, Binny, actually, uh, from viewers who are asking, for example, uh, what do you, why do you need so many servers? Do you need a lot of computing power? Why uh, is your AI proprietary? Could, could you address some of these? Yeah, I saw the questions. All right, why do, we, why do I need so many servers? Uh, number one, one server is um, at home. Um, that is to make sure that if my computer is down, then I have another one that is as a backup. But it also allows me to use the phone and the uh, tablet to remote access into my server. All right. So that's the other aspect. Now, the other three servers will be in the cloud. Okay. So they are running 24 hours. Two of them, they are uh, doing the automated trading, meaning that they are trading into the indexes. They are doing... Uh, trading into the forex, the commodities, etc. So what we do is that we will agree with what our automation says, and then we will put it into the server and let it, let it trade, let it run. So meaning that, for example, we have team to watch. We just have to watch to make sure that the servers are running. But usually because they're in the cloud, they will be running, all right? Uh, that is 24 hours is to maximize our time as well. Because if we are doing into the forex, into the oil, into the futures market, uh, it's either 24 hours or it's definitely more than 20 hours, right? Uh, I, I mean, it's not that I, I'm not, it's not that I don't involve in the US market, but I don't watch the US market. But definitely if there's chance to do the indexes, the Dow Jones or the NASDAQ, and they've been coming down, uh, then we got the shots. So then we will let the machines do the hard work, right? Because as I mentioned, uh, if you look at the longevity of trading, uh, you know, you hit a peak at probably 30 plus. Once you reach the 40 plus, the 50 plus, I haven't reached that yet. I guess that there will be a bit of a decline in the energy level. Okay. And um, the AI that I'm doing is actually proprietary. I, of, of course, I also work with a lot of um, hedge funds, a lot of um, big names out there. Uh, sorry, I can't review too much about that because that's under the NDA. Uh, they are also using a lot of technology in their trading. Uh, so, in fact, that well, we designed some of that for the, the funds and the proprietary traders, etc. Uh, the other one server is for me as a testing. Okay, so that is to test into the system, to run into the alerts that we have. So, you realize a lot of trades I have, I don't look for them. It's being sent to me because that's, that's the other server that will tell me that, hey, look, that's a drop in oil, there's a, there's a rise in gold, and then the Aussie is heading up or is heading down, etc. So, that's the purpose of all the different servers that I'm running at the moment, okay? Uh, what other questions, Edward? I can't remember already. Um, is Somebody any... was, mm. uh, yeah, so they're asking if it was uh, proprietary. Uh, do they have to be good at statistics and math to be able to do all this? What I, I guess someone is asking about your background. Yeah, I, my background is actually in research, statistical research. Uh, in my early days, I did a lot of uh, qualitative research for the uh, research houses, for the, uh, you know, uh, the companies, etc. But my background is actually in quantitative research. <laughs> all right. Okay, that's the other side. Now, I think that for the retailers, what is very important is that if you're involved in equities, it is good to, for like what Joey is doing, it is good to have like a bit of a scanner or a screener to screen out relevant stocks. It's back to, for example, your trading strategy. So for example, if your trading strategy is momentum based, meaning that you are out there to look for stocks uh, which are moving right now, Okay, so you want to use, uh, you know, scanning criteria like which are the stocks that has increased in volume, 
All right, for example, increase of 150% to 100% in volume. Now, usually when there is an increase in volume, it means that people will have interest, all right? And that's where is the start of a movement. So that's number one. Number two, if you're also involved in momentum, you want to hunt for stocks, right? For example, where there's increment in price. So for example, stocks that increase in 2% in a day or 3% in a day or a combination of the rules, increase in price and increase in volume. So that would, that would probably get new stocks like last week, uh, SIA, all right? And uh, some of the laggards, for example, the hospitality, all right? So these are the things that as a beginner, you can do uh, to go and scan for stocks. So if you're listening to this and you're a viewer and you're wondering like, huh, wow, so complicated to be a trader on. Uh. So traders got different levels. La. It's like, you know, you play computer games, right? So like if Bini and Joey reach level 99 already, we are still level 10, okay? So don't worry. You work hard at it. You slowly learn, you can still get there. One. All right, so we're moving on to Joey right now because there is a question about trading more volatile counters. Uh, things like Medtex and the glove stocks last year, you, you definitely, when uh, you went through that period, you, lots of your clients must have been trading in them. Could you share with us some of your tips and tricks for how to manage the volatility when, when these stocks are trading like that? Okay, hey, good, sure. So basically, I think um, Top Glove, um, you know, some of the medical counters, UG Healthcare, these are some of the names that have gone up, like we say, since like April, May. And in fact, I did cover some of these stocks as well since like May last year. And most, most of them went up like more than 50, 100%, I would say, over the past, I um, mean, then it was like three to four months, it can go up like from like, you know, 80 cents to like maybe $3, right? In just about four months. So that's quite a lot, right? And why did it go up then? Because that was then when COVID hit, all right? And that's why, you know, the shift, um, of play, all right, of all the funds for going into those, you know, you know, medical plays, you know, the glove makers, all right, and, and anybody who had to do with uh, medical equipment, right, those are the companies that were pretty much, you know, enjoying huge demand for their businesses because we have like government contracts around the world securing their, their supplies from these companies. And that was where, you know, these stocks started to run up and there was a very, very good uptrend, all right, and how do we treat, um, such stocks. So what happens is, you know, these stocks have gone up by, you know, like, as I say, 100%, 200%. So it's quite a huge amount. All right. So if you're going for such stocks, and yes, indeed, we did went for it as well. And it was a very good uptrend. But because there's, a, a, I mean, there's a risk because these stocks have gone up by 100, 200% over a very short period of time. It's not like two years or five years. It's over a short period of time. So whenever there are any news turn, turning, all right, in terms of like maybe a vaccine being found, that was exactly what happened in November when the vaccine was talks about a vaccine and all that. And that's why people started to sell down fast on these counters, right? So if you're riding on these type of counters whereby, you know, it's quite volatile, but of course, there's still a lot of upside potential because at a point in time, you know, most people weren't, weren't sure, all right, in terms of how long COVID will last and, right, and whether would there be a vaccine in like November last year or maybe it took, it'll take like two or three years, right? So there could be a lot of outside potential. But what you want to do is if you're entering into such stocks while riding the uptrend, what I teach is you want to make sure, all right, you do not cut your profit short, all right? At the same time, letting the stock, right? And how do we do that is, we, of course, you have a stop loss whenever you place a position, right? So most people will just have a stop loss and, you know, the price goes up, they just have the stop loss where it was. But what you do is to raise your stop loss upwards to kind of like protect your profit. So if, if the stock goes from like $1 to maybe like $1.30, great, you're making money, right? 30%, right? So your, your stop loss when you bought it at $1, then maybe it was like 95 cents or 96 cents, fine. But now it's at one thirty, you are 100% making money, right? So my, my, my philosophy is very simple. When you make money, then don't lose it. That's it. It's that simple. So you can, you can raise your stop loss to like maybe 120 or 125. You know, from 130, it comes up to 135. You're out. You still make money, right? But most people will probably, you know, still keep their stop loss at that level. Maybe they don't even have a stop loss, all right? And in the, if the price goes up from like, you know, 130 to 150, great. 160, 182 dollars, great. You raise your stop loss upwards. It comes back down. You hit, you get out. You still make money. All right, so that's how you want to approach such stocks like this, like this, right? With and with you know the idea that you want to let your profits right, you don't want to just cut it short because I mean sometimes you just go to like 120, I think it's too high already. I just never mind, I just sell and don't play already, right? But then you sell at 120, it goes up to two dollars. Ah, yeah, why did I sell, right? So that's what happened, right? So and that's most of the time what happens. So don't don't um, you know cut your profit short, but at the same time make sure you have the you know in terms of the um assurance that if price to fall below a certain level while you're riding, you get out and you still make money. All right. So that is for top glove, UG healthcare, reverse stones and some of the glove stops I mentioned as well. Yeah. Thanks, Joey. Yeah. Trailing stops, folks. If you exactly. don't know what those are, go and read up and find a way. 
Yeah, find yeah. a way to set it up on your brokerage platform, whatever it is. If you're with uh, Joey, you're with Philips, right? Yep. Yeah, if you're in Philips Capital and your Remizia isn't doing it for you, get in touch with Joey. Yeah. Just Google him. We have trainings find... to guide people on like, you know, how to set like a trailing stop. It, yeah. it, it, to be honest, it might seem a bit complicated while trailing stop, how does it work? You know, when I mean, the price moves up, you know, do your stop loss gets, uh, you know, moved up and what's the percentage on it? But to be honest, after you just probably spend like half an hour to read through. I mean, when I first started, that's why I have no idea what all this is, what's, what's a stop limit order, what's a, you know, all that, how to stop loss and all that. But once you know it, I realized that it's, it's not that difficult. I think people tend to complicate things, right? But trading, I think for, for me and even for, I think for Beanie, you have a system to help, you know, we kind of like, we, uh, we don't really need so many screens. In fact, all these screens are just a bit of a distraction. I mean, it's just to keep things like, like four screens, but um, it's just to make things a bit simpler. Like, you, know, that, you know, so I don't have to like, open and close the tab so many times, right? So that's all, right? But it doesn't mean like, well, you have six screens, means you are damn good, no? It doesn't matter at all, right? So, but I would say, keep it simple, all right? Keep, for those of you, I heard, I've read some questions like you're a beginner. So keep it simple. Like, I think just focus like a strategy on that, that works for you. So for me, we uh, I kind of focus more on like a bit of like trend trading momentum, right? So we kind of like ride the trend. Uh, we get out when there are some signs of a weakness or reversal, or maybe you can catch the trend in terms of like, of like a downtrend to an uptrend. That's when you want to position yourself to kind of ride the winds of opportunity and, and kind of like prepare for it, right? So that, that is how we pretty much do it, but there's nothing complicated, right? I look at very, very simple um, indicators like the moving averages, all right? And, and just like, you know, support and resistance lines, kind of gauge in terms of entry and exit. And that's pretty much about it. Other than that, extra you know, indicators, all this can work, but go for the basic, go for the fundamentals before um, you want to go into like all the complicated stuff. That, that's what I feel, yeah. Thanks, Joey. We're going to go back to Bini now. This is a question for both of you actually, but we'll start with Bini. Uh, there's a question from a viewer asking what you do with your trade profits. Do you put them into other asset classes, uh, real estate, properties? Do you invest in more defensive or more conservative stocks? What do you think about robo advisors or do you plow them into derivatives like options? Uh, Bini, let's start with you. Yeah, uh, let me just share with you my experience. Um, never celebrate too much and always give something after you have uh, made some money from the market, all right? Whether to do a simple charity or not, but never, never really celebrate a lot and it has to do with my experience so for example when i was young i had my first win uh, you know it was a lot of money and i really celebrated uh, at, in a way that mm, i think i shouldn't do that and then i was um, uh, you know taught by the market okay that means i taught a lesson by the market <laughs> and uh, now i don't feel a lot about my winnings that means that i don't feel if i win i, I don't i don't get happy uh, it's just a natural game. And sometimes that being correct, it sort of stimulated my mind, okay? But I love the profits. I have to talk about that, right? Uh, we are in this investing or in this trading for money. So that's fact, all right? But yeah, it's evolved to the point where the win no longer thrills me every day. So for example, if you are investing in the Hong Kong market, there are stocks that one day it can move up by 20%. I will get a bit of a kick if I have something like this. Okay, but if a stock that I have, I have and it move, by, it move up by 6%, 8%, uh, you know, it's, it's normal. I don't, I don't celebrate nothing. All right, but, I'll, but what I always do is to transfer a part of the money into something that gives recurring, all right? So things that you might want to consider it's like, for example, to invest that into uh, bonds. I, I'm not, I mean, again, bonds might not be suitable for you guys. I mean, for some of you, or to put it into something that's recurring. And I did that with the Singapore REITs, with the bonds. Or you might want to put it into insurance or anything that can slowly grow your wealth in a more, in a less volatile manner, in a more certain, in, in a more certainty. All right. So that's something that I will do if I have money and, and I will do that. I've been doing that for many, many decades already. Yeah. So it's interesting. You're building actually a very solid, low risk base that slowly grows with the uh, more volatile things that you're doing. It, it's, it, I, I think it's a wonderful strategy. Uh, so Joey, your turn now. What do you What do you do with your trade profits? Do you diversify into other asset classes? Yeah, good question. So basically, I mean, for for me, I mean, like for for the stock market, that, that's what I do every day, and that's you know what. 
um, I teach as well, and, and we, have, we have trading income coming from there. So I, I think it's right to diversify as well. I don't want to just put everything in the stops because like what Bini say, right? I mean, the market can go up and down, all right? So you make money well, great. You know, don't be too happy when you're losing money as well. Don't be too sad, all right? Because you can go up and down, right? Don't celebrate too fast, right? So always believe in like, yeah, just being humble and uh, yeah, whatever gains that I make, you know, what happens is we, I mean, over the past few years as well, you know, we kind of like diversify a bit into, into other asset classes, like maybe like bonds, into like property as well. Maybe like, you know, if you have some spare cash, maybe upgrade a bit, you know, that's that's about it, nothing much. But yeah, maybe in like a bit of property. Um, but I don't do like any exotic like instruments, like all these like structured products or maybe not unit trust. I mean, I used to do like unit trust many, many years back, but it was like quite slow. I prefer focusing on stocks as well because that's my forte all right so not a lot of instruments just like maybe like mainly stocks and property that that would be i would say my main diversification all right and maybe have like a portfolio like beanie as well which is a bit more longer term maybe like a passive income reads portfolio whereby you can get like four or five percent dividend you you can sleep in peace yeah that would do as well right so that, that's what i'm like um, building up as well all right so in like short term then maybe like longer term kind of like passive income portfolio i think that that works right so whichever that fits your own personality that you can sleep in peace right so i think that that is um that would be good for you yeah well that sleeping in peace thing is priceless right? it's worth <laughs> more than anything in the world it's it, it's true because like when Binny mentioned earlier about no longer looking at the US market, I'm like, yeah, I remember those days. I, remember yeah. those. I think yeah. something to add on to, um, you know, being strong in mental health, all right? So if you have this portfolio that you have that's recurring, it adds on to a lot of commitment to your very, very uh, volatile stocks or trading, okay? Because you know that at the back end, all right, I have money still coming in even if i make a losses so you are more able to hold on and get fixated on your trading routes and that's very important all right so for example a lot of people are not able to maintain their stop loss that's it if they have a stop loss they can't maintain their stop loss and they let their losses right because that they fear of losing money their mentality they are not strong all right but if you have the other side to say hey look you know i have an income there and if I, this month or this week of today, I make a loss, at least I'm, I'm covered for, for at least for my family, right? So that's really very important. And addressing into a bit of a stop loss, one of the things that you can do, guys, is that you have a mental stop loss. Having, no, having mental stop loss is better than no stop loss. Let's say, for example, you bought in your stocks and you say that, hey, look, you know, my stop loss is going to be at a dollar. So that's mental because a lot of people think that if I put in a stop loss, my stop loss might be trip trip by or stop hunt or trip trip by some other people because you probably had experience that it hit your stop loss and then after that it bounced up all right so some people don't like to put stop loss so you can put a mental stop loss okay and i saw some of the questions is that how do you take profit so one of the things that if you have a mental stop loss you have a mental profit as well Okay, so for example, if you have, let's say, like me, very aggressive in the Hong Kong market and some of the very liquid stocks, so my mentor take profit is 20%. If you hit 20%, I close my eyes and I take the profit, all right? So different um, portfolio, different trading styles, different objectives. Define that for yourself, all right? Very important. Yeah, but at least have a strategy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the most dangerous thing, going in without a strategy. Uh, next question is for Joey. Uh, a little viewer asks, and it's a fair question. You know, you yep. made back 740K in two and a half years. It's not a small amount of money. So this viewer is asking, wow, how exactly did you do it? Oh, good question. So basically, okay, guys, it's not like 740K in two and a half years, right? So I managed to make that amount, but it's not entirely from like trading profits, all right? You know, you know every day, you know, all right? Um, definitely from um, quite a, you know, a substantial amount come from the trading income, but also with me being a broker, with me really building my broking business in the stock market from scratch. So, you know, when I help clients, when clients make money for their friends, their relatives to me, and that's where I really start from scratch to build my broking income, all right? And, uh, and then, yeah, I mean, when, when you know, that, that's how come, from, from I mean, when, when people make money and that's where you know, they feel their friends and family, all right? And the trading income per month, you know, was like about maybe like 20, 20 plus, 20, 30K. And I remember like um, pretty much like because I have a debt to pay back, right? So I'll just take like, take $1,000. I'll just take like $1,000 just to survive. And I'll pay back to that, the rest like, so it's like 30, 30 minus one, 29 out. All right, that's what happens every single month for like, you know, 
two and a half months to three years, right? So I would say that it's, it's, uh, it was very tiring, right? Very tiring. Uh, you really need to have a lot of mental strength to really go through that period. But I'm glad that uh, yeah, I managed to really come back out from the stock market, from my broking, from the trading income as well, and build the whole portfolio up. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Joey. It, it, folks, don't underestimate the power of just changing the way you spend money and setting money aside. It's really incredible. You think that, oh, I've got no savings. Try saving a thousand dollars a month. It's 12K in a year. Suddenly in eight years, eh? You've almost got a hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so uh, really, if you start small, it, it really turned into a, a, a big pile. You don't have to be think like, oh, I want to be a millionaire straight away. No, start small. Yeah, the pile really starts to grow. Uh, Binny, next question is for you because uh, this person says that they've been trading, uh, but they've been doing it manually. They're looking for ways to automate or semi-automate, but they don't know where to start. Mm. Uh, where would you advise someone to start if they have no experience with that? Okay, a few things. Let me just uh, share a screen. Uh, well, I'm just going to share a screen from the Singapore Exchange. Uh, let me just get that. Here we go. Okay, so as you guys can see, this is uh, under the sgx.com slash research dash education slash data reports, right? So in, the, in my training with, for the SGX uh, Academy, uh, sometimes I will also cover this uh, daily momentum reports, okay? So they, they, they publish every day, right? So they publish uh, every day stocks that have, um, as, well, as well I mentioned, high in volume and uh, increase in price or high in volume decrease in price, okay? So you can have a reference here I mean, as, as to screen every day, which are the stocks that hit uh, certain criteria. So that's number one that you can go to, all right? Uh, it is, it's published every day. Now, number two is that you can see this one that I highlighted under SGX Institution and Retail Fund Flow Weekly Tracker. And I really love this. It's being published every Monday uh, in the morning, depending on the release time is sometimes um, in 10 a.m. or 11 a.m., right? So what this does is that it gives you a list of stocks, sir. Huh? Uh, and especially also the institutional, uh, the component stocks, which are the stocks that institutional bought in, all right? And which are the stocks that they sold? The, uh, the stocks that retailer bought in and then uh, the stocks that they uh, retailer sold, okay? They give you the actually the, the amount, the volume as well. Uh, you are able to see which are the weeks that where institutional bought in and where they sold, okay? They provide very, very useful information. Just to let you know, if you click on the fund flow, uh, let's say I think this week, uh, published on the 22nd 2nd of Feb, and then... Uh, last week as well, you will see that they bought in a lot of banks, okay, the three banks. And we see that, for example, last week, uh, this week, uh, Singapore banks actually move up. So that can be a reference for you guys. Okay, so that's one of the things. Now, second thing is that I rely a lot on charts. Okay, so uh, you might want to get into your charts from your brokers as well. So to, to look a bit of a charting. Uh, if you can attend the lessons uh, conducted by myself and then Joey also conducting some lessons and then some of the SGX Academy uh, trainer also doing lessons there. Uh, so we, for myself, I, I do a lot of uh, stocks. I also do some of the Chinese lesson and I, I di I'm doing the, uh, the one on derivative trading under the Simski. All right, so that's the basic lesson, but it can provide a very good inroad for you to understand what trading is really about. And more important is to get uh, educate, educated, all right? So very quickly, uh, and it's just for a small minority of the viewers, I know most of our viewers will know what it is. The Simski is just the STI, is, is essentially. It, uh, it's, the, yeah. it, it's pretty much the same thing. It's just uh, that... It, it's tracked the STI, but it's not yeah. STI. It's, um, it's the Singapore Index Futures. It's moved with the Simski Index, okay? Uh, in the Simski Index, uh, you have the component stocks, three banks that stands about 49%. So in a way, if you are trading into Simski, you are also trading into the three banks. Okay? The good thing about Simski is, number one, I know I'm doing that for SGS on the uh, product. So it's leverage. Right? It means that you can use a small amount of money all right, to trade into a huge, pop, a huge contract. But again, you need to be are qualified as well. Okay, so it's under the SIP. So you need to be qualified. All right, so talk to a broker about it. And number two is that with the Simski, you could go long or go short. Long means you could buy if you think that it's going to be bullish. You could go short if you think that in the near future, it's going to be bearish. 
right? So it let you capture both direction of the market, okay? So third thing is good that you don't have individual stock picking, meaning that you could just trade the index and it's, it's more like uh, you, you don't need to consider too much to say, hey, today I want to buy into banks or I want to go into rumor or certain stocks, right? Just do the index with you. Thanks, Vinny. So we're running short of time. So next question is for Joey because second last panel of the day already. We've had lots of speakers today. Lots of people have been hearing lots of things. Our viewers are like itchy to go and trade. Uh, but before they start on Monday, before they op fire up their broker platform, what, I'll start with Joey. What are some of the most important things they should keep in mind, Joey? I would say one of the most important thing um, when it comes to really, whether is it like trading or maybe even investing in a market would be really to like have a plan. I mean, of course you need to have a strategy as well, but whatever strategy you use, I think it's good to have a plan. Basically like when do you actually get out? If it hits a certain level, when if you were to fall below a certain level, you want to stop loss. I think some of you are asking about stop loss. What price should we set? What's the, what's the percentage we should set? It, it, it differs from different strategies. For me, I would set like a, specific price level, right? Which shows that the trade has pretty much gone wrong. All right. And yeah, so it depends. So I think it's good to have a plan, write it down. I mean, I, I would say it's good. Like what Benin mentioned, you have a mental stop loss, it, it better than nothing, right? But I would prefer to like write it down because it's just very simple, nothing complicated. Right? I just have an Excel spreadsheet, you know, you just like the name and then the stop loss price, the target price, you just write it down. And so when you look at it and, and maybe like the, there's another call, uh, another cell that you can type in like the reason why you bought a stop. Because most people buy and after like two weeks, they have no idea why they even bought it, right? So have a reason. So when you look at it, like, you know, two weeks later when the price has moved up or down, you look at the reason, you look at your price, you look at the whole plan, it kind of makes sense the why you end up, right? And I think that really will help anyone in, in the market, whether you're like beginner or, you're, uh, you know, uh, whether a long-term or short-term investor, you definitely help you when you have a plan written down that you can see, all right? I think that would be helpful and that can definitely help you. Thanks, Joey. Yeah, Jack Schwager was talking about that earlier in, in the day also. Um, Bini, anything to add to that? Um, I have two things. One is uh, something that is heartfelt and uh, over the, I think, uh, 20 years of trading, all right, is that don't let the trade control you. Instead, you control the trade, all right? I'm not sure, uh, you know, whether you can understand this. You have to really feel it, trade it, and then you understand. <laughs> you really can understand what I mean, okay? Don't let the trade control you because it can be very harmful, all right? Especially if you hit into losses and then you might not be able to function as a person, okay? Now, let's imagine that you're going to go and trade on Monday. So one of the things I find that is very useful is that a lot of brokers, all right, they have a, an alert system, Okay. What, what you can do is that you can key in the price that you are willing to take a look. Okay. So for example, uh, let, you want to take a look at the OCBC at $10 because $10 would be a very, very attractive price to you rather than you, uh, you know, uh, go and hunt and then go and uh, 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 wait for, rather than you go and wait for OCBC, you let, you key in this number there. And then when it hit this price and you alert via your email or your phone, okay, then you go and take a look. That's where you have a good control of your trade. And the good thing is that a lot of brokers offer this alert system free of charge. You don't need to pay any money. All right. So do your homework at night, key in the price, when in the morning, all right, when it hit, all right, you go and look for them. Okay, that's where you can control your trade. Thanks, Vinny. Last one minute. Joey, uh, simulated trading competition next week, Monday to Friday. Somebody wants to win the 5,000 bucks. What's the most <laughs> ridiculous YOLO strategy they can use? <laughs> ridiculous, uh, wow. I fake, mean, fake. This guy says fake money. <laughs> fake money, right? I mean, because you only have five days, so if you really want to win, I think you have to like go all in into like, I mean, you have to pick like really good counters, momentum counters, breakout counters, which can really perform over the next few days. It will not be like those value play and reads or those slow one, right? So if you want to win the competition, definitely you have to go for that, go for the volume plays, probably the penny stocks are in play. You might want to focus on some of them as well, but as I say, real money and virtual money is different, right? So because now it's real money, I mean, it's virtual money, right? And you want to just really go for that, then probably some penny stocks can go up like 5, 10, 20%, but when you go for real money, make sure you have a plan. <laughs> yeah, like I see WX Global. Oh, up 40%? <laughs> Top trading Definitely. volume? Sure, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Bini, what, what would you suggest? Yeah, a um, few things. Number one, because it's a fixed time. So like what Joey say, go for momentum stocks. What's momentum stock? Find one with a good volume, huge volume, huge search and volume. Number two, um, uh, 
huge increase in price, okay, you have to do that for momentum stocks. Okay, be ready to go short, meaning that not only to buy, because if the market is in a bearish mode as what we are seeing right now, be ready to go short, adopt both direction and choose the fastest market. Okay, so for example, some stocks in Singapore are a little bit slower, and if you if they have DLCs there, then go for the Hong Kong DLCs. Okay, so that's the few advice I have. Thank you, Benny, and thank you, Joey, our two professional traders and trainers. Now, ladies and gentlemen, our final session today is coming up at 5 p.m. I'll be speaking with Robin Ho, Wong Kong Hao, Darren Tung, and Keith Chan about three marketplaces you can try for 2021. Well, on the Mandarin side, Kenny Lo, Ta Hui He, Bu Bear Bursa, the Anson, and you, Joey. 谈创造第一桶金的旅程，那请按在网页上端的选项，前往下一个节目或者按share So, ladies and gentlemen, please click on the bottom, uh, the buttons that appear on the top of the page to go to your next preferred sessions. Once again, thank you very much to Binny Ong and Joey Choi. We really appreciate you joining us today, and we wish everyone all the